Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, my name is Wally Allegbede, president of the Rochester branch of the NAACP. So earlier this month, uh, Mayo Clinic and our branch uh, engaged in uh, a strategic collaboration uh, with a program called Rise for You to really uh, provide the youth in our community with, uh, uh, with leadership uh, uh, capabilities uh, and, and a program to really help them uh, uh, achieve uh, this new pathways to success. Uh, so uh, this series, uh, this event is, is, is part of that continuation of the Empower Month that we've been doing all, all, all month long. Uh, you know, it's also important to share that uh, at the end of where everybody uh, has equal opportunity where there's there's no racial hatred, there's no discrimination. And so that's our vision. And the way we get to this, the way we really achieve this is true equity and social justice. And Rise for Youth is an example of how we do that, uh, focusing on, on educational opportunities, especially for the youth. So uh, we are most appreciative of the strategic collaboration uh, between Mayo Clinic. The other thing to really also share is that uh, uh, earlier this month, or actually earlier this week, you know, we uh, launched an online application for students that are interested in this program. And so I encourage students, I encourage parents to, uh, to check it out. Uh, but, the, but the application is, is live and, uh, and it's, uh, uh, students are able to get access to this. I also want to encourage uh, 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 folks to please reach out to us at the end of ACP at Mayo Clinic if you have any, any issues or any questions. Uh, in addition to this, uh, it's important to also share that the national end of ACP sees the rise for youth as an example of Mayo Clinic taking concrete steps towards uh, racial justice. And, and so uh, we have Mr. W.C. Jordan he is the president of the Minnesota and Dakota State Area Conference. He's also the vice president of our Rochester branch of the NAACP. And he's gonna share a few words about this program and, and what this also means to the state. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Good afternoon and thank you, Wale. My name is W.C. Jordan, and I serve as the president of the Minnesota Dakota's Area State Conference for the NAACP. Uh, we welcome the RISE program. The Minnesota Dakota's Area State Conference applies the Rochester branch of the NAACP, and especially Mayo Clinic, for creating the RISE program that will establish a new pathway to success for Black and underrepresented students. As we acknowledge the lack of opportunity across Minnesota for people of color, different strategies have been developed to create opportunities and now yet another program to assist minority youth in their quest for excellence. Through the Minnesota State Audit of Key Indicators, the Joint Disparity Task Force, the Post Disparity Task Force, and the Twin Cities Economic and Inclusion Plan, the disparities of Minnesota are well documented. Now, what we see out of these studies basically is there are two Minnesotas, one white, one black, separate and unequal. Minnesota is the home of some of the greatest racial disparities for African-American people in the country. Minnesota's racial disparities in education, employment, income, poverty, home ownership, health, criminal justice, and the juvenile justice system are among the worst in the nation in every key indicator of quality of life. I like the idea of November as Empower Month, and we applaud this partnership and look forward to the positive outcomes it will produce in the future. Thank you. And at this time, I will introduce the co-moderator, Tawana Burks. Thank you.
So uh, a little bit about Tawanda Berg. So, and many of you in our community know her. She's a, a strong advocate uh, for social justice. Uh, Tawanda is uh, an entrepreneur, a leader uh, with passion in small business. Uh, she owns her own small business, uh, Alocina uh, LLC. And uh, also uh, Tawanda is a project manager uh, at Mayo Clinic. Uh, uh, she's a, a strong part of our community. And, and Tawanda, you're engaged in a lot of stuff. So I, I'm not sure uh, if there are additional words you want to share, but we are really most excited to have you here with us. Thank you, Wally. Our, our other co-moderator is Justin Cook. And, and Justin Cook, he is our, uh, he's a member of the NAACP. He serves as the co-chair of our education committee of the Rochester branch. Uh, Justin is a strong advocate uh, for social justice. He's uh, uh, really engaged in education. Uh, he's a lawyer by training. Uh, an attorney and also a public schools advocate. So Justin, really appreciate you and Tawanda for, for being able to uh, moderate this event. Thanks, Wale, uh, and thanks for uh, um, you know introducing the RISE program. I think it's the, the future is really bright here in Rochester and uh, we're all very excited about seeing that program get off to a great success. Um, anybody who's, who's tuning in right now or watching this later, the applications are available right now, um, so make sure you check out the Rochester Branch website, learn more about that. Um, and coming up, uh, we have really assembled some awesome panelists to, to talk a little bit to us about, um, about economic and educational disparities in Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, what, what we can do about it and, uh, and kind of reflect on that together. So, really excited for this conversation. Um, I'd like to just invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves. And um, Tawanda, as long as it's okay with you, maybe we start with uh, Ms. Jerry Irby. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Jerry Irby. I am the chair in human resources over the workforce practice. And the workforce practice includes compensation benefits, um, leadership development, training, learning, uh, sustainability from a green environment perspective, and also well-being, mental health, and joy. Nice to be here. Thanks so much. And then Mr. Scott Beck. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be joining you all here. Uh, I am the Chief Operating Officer for our clinical laboratory activities here at Mayo, which includes uh, laboratory services that we provide for patients who come here to be served, as well as an external facing laboratory that provides services to 4,000 plus clients all over the world. And our department has about uh, 4,500 staff members uh, that, that we uh, employ as a part of our team. And uh, we have our, our uh, own goals and challenges as it relates to diversity and equity. And I look forward to talking about those and exploring those with my fellow panelists this evening. And, oh, and uh, Kent Pickell. Uh, good evening. Thanks so much for the invitation. I am a little more than four months into serving as interim superintendent here in Rochester. My background started um, as a, a high school teacher and as an administrator, and then through lots of uh, twists and turns, spent the last 15 years in the world of research, first at the University of Minnesota and then at a nonprofit applied research organization called Search Institute. And then when the opportunity to return to more directly being involved with students and systems came up uh, last spring, uh, applied for the position and have been really energized by the opportunities and the challenges that we have here in Rochester. Thank you all for actually being here tonight. So we really do appreciate it. Good evening. Um, I'm just presuming you want me to proceed, Tawanda? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, thank you. I'm Barbara Jordan, and I am uh, just delighted to be on the panel with my colleagues this evening. Uh, for me, this represents uh, an extension of my day-to-day -day work life to be able to be involved with RISE. And I'm just so excited because we know, based on the work we do uh, in our Office for Education, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Mayo, that these type of 
familiarization, exploration, preparation programs are indeed a best practice in our communities and outcomes can be just tremendous. So I'm excited to be a part of the panel and to just really excited about the future for young people in our community based on their ability to participate in this program. So thank you all. So maybe just to, to kick things off and um, uh, the panelists are, had been told that this is a, um, an informal, friendly, but ultimately informative conversation is what we're after. So feel free to address each other. Wanda and I will try to keep us on task and moving along um, to different topics to make sure that we're able to explore some, um, some thoughts. Um, but just to kick it off and I'll, um, I'll, I'm gonna address this to everybody and, and um, maybe we'll start for this first question just in the same order that y'all just introduced yourself in. And I was wondering if you could name one or two barriers to educational opportunity or to professional opportunity for black and underrepresented youth in Rochester um, that you've observed go unrecognized by some in our community. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll go first. I think I was the first to be introduced. Um, you know, it, it's hard to actually pinpoint uh, a barrier that goes unrecognized because I think many of us actually know what the issues and the challenges are. It's just what muscle is being put behind them to actually remove them or to mitigate. And so, you know, uh, I'll just name a couple because I know this, go this question goes to the entire panel. A couple of things that we need to be uber focused on and at Mayo absolutely have the influence to shape. Um, one of them is related to financial barriers to get access to the education and the training that um, people need in order to be super competitive. Um, and, um, and there are a number of ways by which to achieve that. So for example, at Mayo, we have put additional dollars behind uh, how we reimburse people for education, but also not require that they be, uh, that they have to upfront, you know, the cost to educational programs. So how do we actually fund them without people having to actually reach into their own pockets? Um, and there's, there's another one that I'll cite, and I know some other good things are going to come through this discussion, and that is awareness. Um, as an HR professional, I am, um, I have up close and personal sight into how people get selected for jobs, how people get differentiated when it comes to resumes and interviews, um, what extra kind of unspoken qualifications and skills do people look for when they're competing for jobs, right? And um, often we hear things like fit, what does fit really mean? I would be more than happy to explain what fit means <laughs> to people who are in hiring position, uh, in the position of hiring individuals to become part of their organizations. So, so I get excited when there are people like me who are willing to be very transparent and forthcoming about what that looks like when candidates are not in the room. And so, so I look forward to breaking that barrier personally. I might just pick up a little bit on what, on what Jerry uh, indicated and extend that into the hiring process. Uh, we were having uh, discussions in our office actually this morning around you know, diversity on the, the interview panels and how to make sure that the people who are doing the interviews are aware of unconscious biases, uh, that we really are trying to make every effort to ensure we have diversity around the panels so that uh, people they feel more comfortable and we're putting a focus on where some of those challenges are, which is the implicit bias that people sometimes have in the hiring process and trying to pay more attention to that. Uh, and, and so I think oftentimes you think about, yes, there are a lot of challenges on the educational opportunities and the access, but there's also that, that follow through that starts with the HR staff being out and visible and getting the applications in, but also going through the process and actually into that interview where you're really working hard to identify really great qualified individuals, uh, regardless of their race and background, but always looking to make sure you have diverse pools available. Thank you, colleagues. And I'll just pick up 
from um, kind of my little slice of the pie here in terms of uh, what we see as we recruit young people into uh, careers in healthcare. And we have an adage that I'm sure you all have heard that you can't be what you can't see. And um, I think that's one of our greatest challenges for kids of color in our community, especially African-American kids. Only 8% of US physicians are black and our population is 13% in the country. And many of those physicians are uh, of the, you know, they're elderly, of their older physicians. And so even though we're the pathway to medical education, we're constantly across the country. So many people are working to engorge that with black and underrepresented learners. We still lag behind. So often kids in our community, they know of Mayo Clinic, they know of a, the careers in medicine, but it's skin deep. So I think what RISE can do through our programming that we have planned already is to really bring exposure to the multitude of, of healthcare careers. And I, I know Jerry and her colleague talk about, um, her colleagues in healthcare talk are really trying to instill in young people that you don't have to be the doctor or the nurse. There are so many other caring professions that you can be a part of and RISE will serve to try to um, bring all of those to the fore for our young people, although our goal is simply employment, not just healthcare employment. And finally, access to experiences. When I'm reviewing applications for the medical school, I still am, you know, I'm happy for the kids who have the experiences of shadowing and working in a clinic and traveling abroad to deliver health care. Those things cost money. You have to have resources often to be able to go over and build a water supply system in a foreign country. Well, many of our kids in this community, you know, they're working during the summer. They don't have the opportunity to go and expose themselves and have those experiences that would provide kind of those their ability to dream about those careers. So I think RISE will be just so well positioned to provide those kinds of experiences that allow the kids to dream and dream bigger than what they may see right here in our community today. Um, you know, I think in terms of my world of K-12 education, the biggest barrier to opportunity is uh, uh, related to the biggest factor that influences student outcomes, and that's the quality of teaching that kids receive. There's no factor within the school environment that influences student learning as much as the quality of the teaching. Often that's termed as the quality of the teacher. I prefer to say the quality of the teaching because teacher sounds like we're judging the person. I have not looked at this data in Rochester yet, but in, in the vast majority of school districts, no matter how you slice it, the uh, degree attainment, caliber of the, the undergraduate institution they went to, years of service, in many areas, licensure, I know that's not true of Rochester, uh, kids uh, from historically marginalized communities, kids of color, kids living in poverty, uh, are much less likely to have an opportunity to learn from our most skilled teachers. Um, and uh, in recent years, the research on the impact of a student of color having a teacher of color has been mind blowing. In some ways, it's kind of common sense, but there have now been rigorous, carefully controlled longitudinal studies that have shown that just having one uh, teacher of the same race can have a significant impact on short and long term outcomes. And uh, that's got to be a major effort for us. I was talking with a member of the Rochester Public School staff, who happens to be an African-American woman, and she grew up in Rochester, went to our district, super positive about our district, um, but she said she never had a teacher of color until she went to grad school. Um, in our district right now, 4.43% of our staff are teacher, teachers of color, and that has been flat for many years. And so I just want to name that, because that's something that I think, I know our school board is very focused on that, and it's a, it's a piece of teaching quality that is very important, but um, uh, kids of color also uh, learn from and need highly skilled white teachers uh, who look like me as well. So that'd be my answer to the, the critical barrier is, is, is having those committed educators working with our, our kids who in many cases uh, need them most. Well, thank you. So the next question, actually, I want to open this up to everyone as well. Do you believe we have systems that help us connect and act upon inequities that create barriers to opportunities for Blacks and underrepresented youth in Rochester and Olmstead County? If so, why, why not? Jerry, we can start with you 
again if you would like. Thank, I shouldn't have put myself on mute because I don't know how to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll speak in terms of maybe a generality um, that serves as a barrier. Um, and, and this is not unique to Mayo. This is not unique to Rochester. Um, but I, I get a little bit dismayed by people who think they're doing well by interviewing and maybe hiring <laughs> an underrepresented um, minority in their organization. I find that, um, that there's under focus or lack of focus on where those individuals get hired in the organization. <laughs> and, um, and I also think that people um, don't give enough attention to what the culture feels like when they get there. And so, um, so, so just kind of a general statement about barriers <laughs> and systems and places, being uh, too focused on kind of what I sometimes call bean counting, right? Like setting a metric and think you're doing well for yourself when you hire certain people. I, I, I find that more often the problem is the kind of environment um, that is set up and exists that either allows or serves as a um, impediment or barrier for people being able to thrive and realize their potential. I feel so passionate about this because we often kind of point to the person that we've hired and said, you didn't make it, you didn't do well because you weren't prepared or we made a bad hiring decision. And so, so I'm kind of um, ambiguous, ambiguously kind of describing a system. Uh, <laughs> it's really kind of more of a kind of a, uh, a, a, a way of behaving and kind of a mindset that organizations perpetuate when it comes to ensuring that we have people at all levels of the organization who can thrive, represent, and, and create a culture where everyone can do their best. Um, and, and I'll just say this one thing and I'll pass the microphone. I was at a conference recently, um, along with a couple of you, especially my friend Barbara, and um, the, the statement that was said, that was articulated that really resonated with me was, if you believe that talent is created equally, then why not also kind of the representation? Um, and so um, it kind of uh, smacks in the face this notion that, right, that all the ethnic minorities don't just exist at the bottom of the organization, right? If you believe that talent is created equally. So, so um, a barrier to um, having people in decision-making and authority positions uh, to change organizations and make them welcome to all people. Yeah, so I I, um, I come from a bit of a I'm an analytic person. I you know I've done enough personality categorizers to know that that I, I tend to be a analytical person, and I I appreciate uh, Jerry's perspective a great deal. But I, I also know that that Jerry's organization in Mayo is also providing us with data over these past few years that we traditionally haven't had ready access to as managers and supervisors. Uh, I can now tell you, you know, what percent of people who were um, submitted applications, who were offered interviews, who participated in interviews, who weren't selected for positions, and we can do breakdowns uh, based on whether they're uh, self-described as being disabled, or black, or white, or you know, gender, uh, and. That data I find particularly helpful because it, it, it really helps me quantify, you know, where do we have really major gaps to address? Uh, and to Jerry's point, I know now in my organization about 16% of my staff uh, in the department would uh, have self-described themselves as minorities uh, or people of color. And yet about 6% of the management uh, is uh, considered to be you know, minorities or self-described uh, minorities. And that's a gap that Jerry talks about and she understands that implicitly. Uh, I wanna be able to help you know, come up with and target programs that can really help address that gap. And some of it is recognizing that 
it is the environment. It's it's maybe it's creating the right mentorship programs or the right system so that when people come into the organization, they um, are are understanding that there are opportunities for them to join in interest groups, uh, that they're able to identify with people who are like them in positions of management positions. You know, back, I think, to Kent's point about teachers, it's about seeing other people in roles that you would aspire to be in. How do we make sure that we're engaging those people as we bring people into the organization and making them feel comfortable and welcome as they come through the organization? And those are, those are things that uh, um, I appreciate having the data because then it really helps us, I think, create and target some programs to help close that gap. Uh, and I think that's you know, to the point of the question around uh, not just understanding, but then how do you act on that? Uh, I think it's that, you know, how are we making sure we're targeting those, those major gaps when we identify them? Wow, I'm learning a lot from my colleagues this evening um, as we look at the different perspectives on this. So I'm I'm trying to recall the the words that in Tawanda's question that I'm I'm reflecting on are um, systemic issues that are um, plaguing our community and our education. And I'm gonna I'm going to underscore something that Kent and Jerry and Scott have talked about. Um, I think the lack of teachers of color is such a big systemic issue for kids in Rochester. I'll tell you two quick things. Um, my daughter, another one, K through 12, no teachers of color. In her uh, junior year, they're studying enslavement. And they view the iconic photo that we've all seen of a slave ship and how the bodies were stacked head to toe, end over end every inch of the cargo hole filled with black bodies. And one of the young women who happened to be white in, her, in Angie's class said, excuse me, teacher, I think if they did it this way, she had drawn out a diagram, they could have got more people in the hole. And a white teacher, completely unprepared, not knowing what to say, just kind of nodded and moved on. Now, as a, a kid of color, you're you are just, you know, what are you to do? If that had been a black teacher, I'm sure it would have been handled differently and the kids of color would not have been marginalized and felt that they were lesser than. So it's in the classroom that things like that happen. Fast forward to the same, you know, Angie going to an HBCU where she says, mom, the teachers treat us like we're their family. So the black kids in our community, and I know Angie's had, had some great white teachers to Kent's point, you know, you don't have to have cancer to treat cancer. We know that. You don't have to be black to teach black kids, but we ought to have the representation. And that systemic gap in our, in our schools, every fall, every summer or every graduation cycle, I look at the post bulletin and I love Christy Blade and I, I need to sit down and talk to Christy. And it's not Christy's fault, but they publish the academic superstars and I have watched it for the 30 years I have been in Rochester. And I can tell you, I never, never see black kids, never. I just, it frustrates me every year because what is it, it are, are our kids just not there? And if they aren't, why aren't they academic superstars? So that's why I get excited about RISE and all the work that we can do as community with Mayo Clinic and community and NAACP to ensure that those pages don't, aren't devoid of kids. Of, I, I would say kids of color. Of course, I'm looking for the black kids, but representation and a faculty in our schools that looks like the kids, the what is it, Kent? 30 plus plus percent of our kids are of color in RPS. So I'm gonna stop because y'all know I get excited when I think about these gaps that we are facing in our community. Uh, yeah, well, this is such a, a it's such a good conversation. I can be really brief and just say that when you ask about a system question. Uh, one of the most positive things I think that's happened in my field of education in the last 
really 20 years is the movement to emphasize equity. And it started with No Child Left Behind, which we could talk about its ancient history now. But it's good that now it's on the tongues of most superintendents, most people. I was up in the Twin Cities today for a a conference of, of the urban school districts in Minnesota, and everybody's talking about equity, equity. I think one of the risks is that ed, educational ec- equity can be a movement without a method. It's this idea that it's all hearts and minds and passion, and we need systems and processes that will address issues like, for instance, recruiting, retaining, and supporting staff of color. So when you ask the question, do we have the systems, I want to say in Rochester Public Schools, the answer is no, but Before I showed up here, our school board made a definitive decision to begin creating them. They created an Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and we hired a very talented uh, educator, Will Ruffin II, who's our first director of that office. And so I made one of my three goals for my tenure as interim superintendent, working with Will and our equity specialists on our team to create the DEI function in Rochester Public Schools. It's one of the goals the board will be judging me on, along with creating a strategic plan and keeping our schools safe and open during COVID. And so we don't have systems to get at some of those issues like teacher diversity. And we'll, I know we talk about student achievement around equity, but the good news is we can create them. And there's a lot of experience and, uh, and research um, around the country. And it's actually one of the things that I think Mayo Clinic could be most helpful to us as a system is thinking like a system. Um, Cause that's what Mayo is obviously very, very good at um, in some areas. So uh, we don't have it, but uh, we have made, before I ever showed up here, a really fundamental decision on the part of our school board to build it. I am just loving this conversation. Thank you all so much for, for bringing your perspectives and for uh, um, th- that. It really is just a, a gift to, to hear you all talking so accessibly. Um, so the next question here, I'm going to come right back to you, Kent, at least to, to start. If anybody else wants to chime in, that's, that's just fine. Cause I think we already heard little bits and pieces of possible answers to this, but maybe just to underscore, give you all a chance to underscore it. Um, why is it important for underrepresented students to have equal opportunities to receive education? What's in it for us? Um, just really briefly, the, I think the key point I would say is equal doesn't mean um, identical. Um, and that when kids are bringing uh, in with them into the classroom, incredible talent, incredible abilities, hopes and dreams, but also perhaps um, some skill gaps based upon the instruction that they received in previous years, those kids need more. They need additional support. I mentioned a minute ago that the era of No Child Left Behind, which as many of you may know, was a federal education law that really for 10 years shaped um, our, our, our nation's schools. And one of the things that I think we learned in No Child Left Behind, which was very focused on equity, we could debate a lot about whether it was a good focus or not. But when you started measuring test scores and gaps between groups of kids and then demanding that schools close those gaps, What almost without exception, and I was an administrator who did this too, everybody got the same strategy. So everybody got the same reading curriculum, everybody got the same counseling, but the plan was really to close gaps and yet everybody was getting the same content. So what happened? The gaps widened because the kids who were well prepared to benefit from that good curriculum, that good enhanced content made more progress. It was not a targeted strategy. The kids who need more need different. And that's why I'm so excited about RISE, because it is targeted on those kids who are going to need more. If we use universal interventions, we aren't going to accelerate uh, achievement. Um, One of my favorite examples, it's a program I'd love to bring to Rochester. It started in Chicago. It's it's now called Becoming a Man. They have a version they've also created for girls. And it's uh, mostly African-American boys who have a, uh, who are at least two grade levels behind uh, middle school, upper elementary, and they work with young African-American men. And it's all using a very structured tutoring program and it's in mathematics and it's part great support academically but there's a strong cultural and mentoring component to it and the progress that they've made in becoming a man um, and you can look at rigorous randomized control tell two grade levels of progress in a year Um, and it's because it's targeted it's culture responsive it's academically sound Um, and if we want to make this kind of progress that's what equality is going to take it's going to take some of those targeted strategies. We also need to do the all rising tide lift all boats. So I, I'm not suggesting we don't need 
universal strategies, but we are going to need to find ways to identify the kids who need that additional support and put in place those resources for them. Sounds good. Ken, actually, I want to follow up with you with another question. When it comes to addressing education and inequity, what action can the students take themselves to address issues that impact them directly? And what actions can the school leaders take? Uh, speak up in positive and engaged ways. I, I'm just going to actually talk with one very specific example. Um, I have a mentee here in Rochester. Her name is Salma Abdi. She's a senior at Century High School. And she met me at some events and she said, hey, I, I want to do a project. Would you work with me? She experienced earlier in her high school career what she believed was and what from my conversations with her, I would agree were, was, was harassment based upon uh, race. And she reported it, which a lot of kids don't do, to school leadership. And she didn't know, as you usually can't know, what disciplinary actions were taken, uh, you know, if any. And nobody really explained that to her. I said, you know, they couldn't tell you what they did if they did something. So that was a gap. But she said, I want to create a, pro a process that a student who believes they've experienced uh, racial harassment can follow to actually uh, have it investigated and responded to. And so her project for her senior year, it's what I'm working with her on, and she's reached out to members of our school board and others, is to create um, essentially a roadmap for how a student could take a concern like that that would be understandable to a high school student. And I told her when we met last week, I said, you know, this might end up in school board policy and procedure. I mean, that's getting ahead of things, but this is entirely youth led. And she wanted to, before she goes off to whatever great things she's gonna do next in her career, she wanted to try and think about a way to create some systems and processes for kids in Rochester who might experience what she had experienced. Um, so that's one very present example for me of how a student is taking that, um, uh, taking that opportunity to try and meaningfully uh, shift the system. And I'm really excited about, uh, about her project and, and hopeful that it's gonna result in something that can help improve Rochester Public Schools after she's uh, on to what's next for her. Can I, I loved um, that follow up, follow up you just provided. I um, want to draw a parallel between what happens kind of for students when they want to raise issues, kind of raise the flag, right, versus what employees do within organizations when they too experience, uh, you know, discrimination or bias, if not harassment, um, you know, in a toxic work environment. Uh, we often say that there is a fair process right in place for someone to be heard and then on the other side of kind of raising the flag uh, the way it actually manifests is like no safety right <laughs> you know just um stigma retaliation right uh being kind of um uh, marginalized because you said something and oh by the way you know, it's, there's a lot of danger and risk of being the person who complains about what happened to themselves, right? That's where allyship really comes to play, which needs to both exist kind of in the education system and in the workplace. So um, I was really moved by what you said and, and just drew that parallel from an employer perspective. That's great. I hope she's watching. I, she's she, she's 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 kind of everywhere. And I think one of her key insights was for for her, it has to be a system that works for a high school student. So like the fact that nobody told her if disciplinary action is pursued, they can't tell you about that because she would not have known that. And I, I said, because that's a human resource issue. They're not going to come back and tell you what if anything happened. She said, oh, I wish I had known that they can't tell me what potentially might have been the outcome. Um, and so that's something we're going to bake into the process. Let the student know that there's privacy that needs to govern HR processes. You don't know that at 17 or 16. Um, all right. I, I have a question. I'd like to get Scott in on this one. Um, but uh, everyone else, feel free to, to add your perspectives as well here. Um, so do you believe it is important, and, and I'm, I'm interested in your analytic perspective here, Scott, do, do you believe it's important to have an intentional focus as opposed to more maybe a more um, passive um, way of addressing issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion 
within your organization? I think intentionality is, is, is important. Um, and I, I would say that it, it to me, it, it stems from a basic recognition that diversity is actually proven to be better organizationally. Uh, it is showing that organizations have strategic advantages. Uh, you accelerate innovation by having diverse thoughts around the table. Uh, you can attack problems differently and more effectively by having diversity of backgrounds uh, around the table. Uh, I think if you're able to do that as an organization, you improve productivity, you improve job satisfaction. Uh, that leads to improved quality. Uh, and, I, and I think as a healthcare organization, um, we, we strive, you know, those seven words that really set us apart of the needs of the patient come first would cause us to take intentional steps toward pursuing strategies that we believe give us an advantage organizationally, which is to better serve our patients. And if we actually believe, as I think organizationally we do, that diversity actually is important to achieving that goal, then you have to be intentional about how you pursue that. Uh, and I, I believe that in the past few years, uh, Mayo has become more visible and taken a more proactive approach in making statements about the importance of addressing and ending systemic racism. I think in large part because it believes that as well as an organization. And I think that historically our organization has generally taken a much more, con I'll just say a conservative approach to many issues. Uh, just where we tend to be a much more conservative organization, have been for 150 years. But I think there, there are, uh, the, the recognition of this, I think has really helped Mayo feel much more comfortable in getting out in front of an issue uh, such as systemic racism in ways that I don't believe 10 or 15 or 20 years ago we ever would have as an organization. And I think it's in part because of that recognition. I'll jump in. <laughs> I, love, I love what Scott uh, just said um, as it relates to kind of what I call the business case for diversity, inclusion, equity work, and, and justice and belonging. Um, you know, sometimes I still can't believe I'm, I'm like trying to make the case to people, right? It's not just the good and right and altruistic thing to do. It actually is the smart thing to do. And sometimes I feel like, you know, like what additional evidence can I present to make people really believe it um, and not just let it be work on the corner of their desk, right? But part of really what they do every day organically and naturally. So I always tell my, I have a team of diversity recruitment specialists. And, um, and I tell them all the time, my job is to help work you out of a job. <laughs> Glory be the day that we don't need any more EID, OEID, <laughs> DEI teams, because that means it's just become part of what we do, right? It's like second nature advocates, championing, mentoring, supporting, lifting, elevating, um, this work just becomes um, part of our natural fabric. You know, I, I, ha I happened to uh, uh, see an interview with the uh, commander of the United States Marine Corps, uh, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, and he was uh, addressing some of the problems that all businesses are now, which is recruitment and retention of staff. And in his case, Marines. And the increasing rate at which Marines leave the organization after four years. And he was talking specifically about some of the differences in diversity. And he said, look, the Marines have a long and, uh, a long and rich exposure to working in an integrated environment. And as the commander of the Marines, I can tell you that we win wars because of the diversity of our troops. Um, it is uh, one of the strategic advantages that he believes as a Marine officer, the United States has over other countries and that that's been proven through experience, that that diversity gives us an advantage in winning wars 
over countries that are much more homogeneous. That to me is an extremely powerful statement uh, from uh, a, a, a man in charge of you know, what is essentially you know, the only one of the four armed forces that is, is essentially all about fighting, right? I mean, it, it is, it is, that's their job. And his statement is diversity helps us fight better. As business leaders, we take a lot of, frankly, our cues from what military and historians, uh, I think, have learned about how you approach and challenge difficult problems and do so under diff difficult circumstances. And, and, uh, and, and I, I was just, I was struck by that. Uh, and I think it's, it's just another, uh, I think, data point that we continue to take in as leaders in our organizations to say, yeah, there, there is, you know, back to Jerry's point, I think summarizing it very well, it's the business case for why is diversity important? And, and we see this proven uh, through other organizations. And colleagues, if I could, I would say, let's be clear about it. There are tons of kids in this community, African-American kids, kids of color who are excelling, who are doing fantastic work in school, in our community, um, and they go away and they do great things. We are focusing here with this program on that those kids in our community who are at risk of not being successful. So don't get it twisted as the young people will say, we got kids, our kids of color, I, I get to talk to many of them every day, every week. They are fantastic. But we know in reality that there is a there is a group of kids who need that extra push. And with that push, with mentorship, they can excel as well. And I, I'm a borrow from uh, President Barack Obama, who says we need every brain in the game. Our country, in order to continue to be competitive and to provide quality of life for all of us, needs to ensure that all of us are in the game. Diversity is not operating from a deficit position. And, and again, don't get that twisted. This is not about lowering standards or you know, making exceptions. None of us want to do that, but we do recognize, y'all think about that graphic with the boxes, that if we gave everybody the same size box, we're gonna have a lot of folks still in the margins. So equity, which we're speaking about, says we've got to, to look at where the needs are. And RISE has identified where the need is, and that's what the program will target. So that in the end, diversity is the asset, not the deficit, it's the asset. So Scott, I wanna do a follow-up question with you. I know that Mayo Clinic Laboratories launched the equal internship program to empower qualified underrepresented administrative leaders. What audience is that internship program targeted towards and what are the aims of that program and how is it going so far? Thanks, Twanda. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the program uh, in, in part because of, uh, I think one of the things that many of us have touched on is the, uh, the multifactorial nature of addressing the, the challenge that we have. And I spoke earlier about looking at diversity in different populations within the department that I operate in here at Mayo, right? 16 and percent diversity in entry level staff, 5% diversity amongst managers. That's a challenge. That means that, you know, we can do a couple of things and, and, and we're choosing to do a both and uh, as opposed to an or approach. One of those is working with our HR colleagues to make sure that we're out in the communities, that we're getting diverse candidate pools, that we're having diverse interview teams, and that we're not only recruiting bright, young, talented people into the organization, but we're hopefully focusing on how we can retain those individuals over periods of time. That is a multi-year approach to see what happens as those individuals come from those positions and move into the management ranks, if things go well. Uh, and we know that, that, that there are challenges along the way. The equal program is really designed to help us jumpstart how we address qualified underrepresented administrative leaders into the management ranks. And it is a program that targets a 10 to 12 week internship 
uh, working first with historically black colleges and universities. We're starting with Florida a and University uh, in, um, in Florida, of course. Um, and we're working with FAMU to uh, identify interns who will be able to come into that program. We pair them up with a senior administrative leader who works in our laboratory activities and operations. And for those three months, then they get exposure uh, to what it's like to work in an office environment, what it's like to be an administrator, what it's like to be in a business. And back to Barbara's point, it is about exposure and it's about seeing and and seeing those opportunities and experiencing those opportunities and hopefully opening up those minds so that they can see themselves in those opportunities. Uh, I would say that's what we wanna be able to do at Target for students. We try to make that easier from, from some of the socioeconomic perspectives by making a commitment to not only uh, pay a, a wage for their internship, but also to make sure we pay for their travel uh, to get here and back and to underwrite the cost of their uh, their living situation uh, for the time that they're here. So we, we, we try to make sure that we're not putting socioeconomic barriers into people to apply for those positions. And then the result is at the end, hopefully we're stimulating and exposing people who historically have been less apt to apply for internships, which we know with having access and seeing that experience. Also, from our perspective, we want people to learn what it's like to work for an organization like Mayo. And as we have people come through every year, uh, we would, would like to have next year six to eight people who are coming through that program so that uh, as they graduate, uh, we can identify those individuals who are mutually interested in having a career in our organization. And we can bring them into the directly into the management uh, pool or into an, a, a rotation program that will bring and expose them into different areas of management that will then move them into that pool. And so it's, a, it's another way of trying to target and bring in people who will help us divert with diversity in a particular area where we see some of those challenges in addition to some of the other tactics that we've talked about. And so that's what the equal program is designed to do. And I think if we're successful, uh, we'll, ex we'll be able to expand that program from FAMU into other historically black college and universities uh, and so that we can bring in you know great qualified candidates and hopefully they all have uh, great experiences uh, we we get the benefit of having them work on projects and activities for us and hopefully uh, choose a career where, where they can uh, come and become members of our organization maybe before too long some of those equal candidates will be uh uh, graduates of the Rise program. Uh, I think it's an that exciting would, idea. That it, it would be it would be wonderful. That 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 would be absolutely wonderful. Just a pipeline. Yes. Um, so I I wanted to follow up a little bit on um, uh, a point that was made just a bit ago, talking about the business case for diversity at Mayo and how that's informed from you know the military strategists and so on. But I I wanted to. Uh, look at that a little bit from a societal uh, impact, or at least regionally in, in the Rochester community. Um, we heard from uh, president of the Rochester branch and of uh, the um, Wale Elegbade and W.C. Jordan, the um, president of the Dakota State, Minnesota Dakota State Conference, that Rochester has some of the worst um, um, economic disparities um, economic racial disparities in the country. The disparity between poverty rate of its black and white residents is among the worst in the country, according to census data. Um, and, you know, understanding that that's, that's part of the equation and understanding Mayo Clinic's really uniquely prominent role um, and impactful role on the Rochester community. Um, and I guess, Jerry, I'm sort of looking at you uh, for this question. Does Mayo Clinic have a role to play in addressing this disparity, or, or does it, it is that part of the equation for uh, for Mayo Clinic as well? Um, so, so the short answer is absolutely, and um, that we have responsibility and accountability in this space. I will confess that um, I just joined Mayo um, in January, 
And I'm one of the first executives that was hired as a 100% teleworker. So I sit in North Carolina, <laughs> which I hope doesn't discredit me <laughs> for this panel discussion. Um, so I, I'm not necessarily prepared to speak as closely to what's happening in the Rochester kind of region. But I will say, again, it's not necessarily unique when I think about what um, the responsibility that organizations have to the communities in which they operate, right? Um, I, you absolutely, um, especially as being the largest employer with the diversity of jobs that we offer, um, you know, um, have responsibility to addressing um, either directly or indirectly. Uh, the poverty in our communities. Um, you know, from a, from a, I could, I could speak on this for quite some time um, and, and I can be a bit verbose. So <laughs> I'll do my best in saying um, indirectly, let me start there very briefly. And it reminds me of a word that was used earlier in this conversation and that is systemic, systemic issues, right? Like we have a way of um, keeping people poor keeping people disadvantaged and underbanded. And this isn't, I'm an, I'm an employee and I'm very proud of the Mayo organization. But again, just kind of almost un, uh, subconsciously or unconsciously um, and preventing people from emerging from their economic, social economic status um, in, in their community. Um, I'll give you a, just a couple of uh, really quick examples so that it's, it's um, maybe resonates a little bit. Um, I belong to an organization, a large healthcare organization, not Mayo, <laughs> um, that um, had a, 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 a tardy and attendance policy. I'm really going to simplify it just to make a point. Um, and when it snowed, uh, there was the same expectation that you get to work, right, and show up from your, for your job as anyone else, anyone who actually has their own transportation. Um, and the policy suggested, now you have to know this is a Southern town because <laughs> this doesn't happen in snowy Minnesota, but the policy suggested if you were tardy or a no-show in inclement weather, uh, where you don't have a lot of snow days, um, three such occurrences would terminate you from your job. And in this community, the dominant uh, you know, um, kind of users of public transportation um, were uh, black and brown members of the community. And the buses and other means by, of public transportation stopped on snow days. And so uh, black people, and bear with me, I know I'm going on and on. <laughs> black and brown people were being terminated for, for tardy and no show occurrences that had nothing to do with anything except the fact that the bus did not run that day. My point is unemployment or being docked, right, somehow from a performance perspective is just one way that we keep people down and we keep people poor and we keep people unemployable. Um, and, and if you multiply this example uh, times many other policies and practices that organizations aren't necessarily thoughtful about, then we will, again, not enable people to rise economically. Um, and then there's a direct um, kind of responsibility, which is how we show up not just right like on zoom calls which is incredibly important but with our feet and with our hands and our brains in the community what are we going to do to lift them up and help pe lift people out of poverty if you are going to take up take up space square footage <laughs> acreage in a community um the assumption is that you actually benefit from the people that live in that community, right? Because they become your the population that you serve and the dollars on which you kind of you know make money. So you must also be a contributor with your time, with your resources, with your ideas, with your innovation. And so we, um, as a you know, as it relates to poverty, we don't need to just make financial contributions, but show up in a very authentic and genuine way that makes people know and understand that we are committed and willing to do whatever it is we need to, to help um, um, reduce poverty in the communities that we serve. You know, I would 
I would just say, I, I think to the point of Mayo and its, its social responsibility, uh, it, it rests on what I think of almost as the very culture and identity of the organization and the community. Uh, the Mayo Clinic didn't choose to put itself in the middle of downtown Rochester, Minnesota. Rochester, Minnesota built itself around the medical center. Uh, the first boss I had at Mayo 29 and a half years ago told me his very first job was essentially to parcel off the lots around the downtown practice so services could be built by local uh, organizations to serve the Mayo Clinic. Um, and the integration of Mayo into the city is I think probably unlike any other academic medical center of our size in the United States. And it has, what has given us, I think, um, such a strength and an edge in the discipline that we bring as reflective of our organization into how we've grown and evolved as an organization. And if you don't have a healthy community in a microcosm that is Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, you do not have in the long term a healthy organization because we're so reliant on the community to support the institution in a bi-directional manner in which the institution also supports the, uh, the city. And that bond is just so strong in our organization. And it's, it's why Rochester and Mayo should and is involved in the public school systems, probably more so than many other uh, academic medical centers is because we're reliant on people who have come up in the environment who are probably going to choose to stay in the community that, that, that they grew up in. And we want to make sure that they're well educated, uh, that they can lead you know, great productive lives and ideally as a part of our organization. Uh, and I think that's what's clearly unique about the organization. And so, um, and I would say that that's, I think, a strength of the organization. Uh, but I, I also defer to somebody who, who was my mentor in a position about 15 years ago. That was Barbara. Uh, when I came in to, uh, to do one of my roles, Barbara was, was, was one of my early mentors uh, and I think helped instill in me that understanding of the societal role and male's role in the society. I think by following and, and looking at how she was spending her time in the, in the community as a part of the organization. I, I think those are, those are great examples. Uh, and and to, to Jerry's point, we'll continue to move forward as an organization to the extent we have people like Barbara who are not only setting a good example, but also everybody who's picking up on those examples uh, and understanding the importance of that and helping to promulgate it going forward. So it is a really unique environment here in Rochester. It's just hard to overstate and you cannot separate the community from the organization. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Scott and I have been, you heard 29 years from him. We are the oldsters on the panel, Jerry, with you being one year, but uh, we've come up together and I'm so glad that we're on the panel together. It's a nice culmination. If I could just point out that the funding for this initial phase of RISE for Youth is coming from the $100 million fund to eliminate racism in our communities, in our, in our state, in our country. Um, so we're starting right here locally with that major, major undertaking that Mayo Clinic has so publicly stated. Um, so it's, you know, we're, we're doing it right here in this community. And the goal, you know, when you look at educating our youth to be successful in this community it's not a far throw to see how that can help eliminate racism, to get them in places where they can show the rest of the community that we too, kids of color can be successful, kids of color can, can lead, kids of color can move into career fields that perhaps have been thought to be uh, off limits to them. So uh, like Scott, I'm very proud of the commitment and I'm just again, thrilled that we see it come into play right here in our community with this program. I am such a fan of this conversation. I, I almost hate to interrupt, but Tawanda, I know we wanted to hit a, a couple more topics before our time is up. Yeah, absolutely. Ken, I actually have the next question for you. 
um, just thinking about the racial dis disparities um, and discipline rates and referrals to law enforcement for students in the Rochester Public Schools, that continues to be on the top of everyone's mind. Now that the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights and the Minnesota Department of Human Rights Agreement have passed, what can you tell us about any ongoing efforts in the Rochester Public Schools system to address these disparities? Um, yeah, I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. I also just want to say when Justin talks about how good this conversation is, I, I was taking some notes on my computer, not multitasking. If it looked like I was like, you know, um, uh, you know, the discipline disparities issues are urgent, and I want to absolutely answer your question. I want to say. And, and they're urgent and they get a lot of attention everywhere around the country. The educational outcome disparities are as urgent and deeply related. So we can come back to that. Um, but with the discipline disparities piece, um, the, that is an issue that I have to say is a great example of what we were talking about earlier, which is a problem that urgently needs action, but that does not have systems and improvement processes behind it. And Rochester is not unique in that regard, but um, every year the discipline disparity data comes out and people lament it appropriately and sometimes get very angry about it, especially if you know your kid or you are one of the kids being impacted by it. Um, but the question really is what systemic processes are we put in, putting in place to get ahead of it? The first step of that needs to be understanding it and understanding what really is happening to the disparities. We know from a pretty large body of research around the country that kids of color, especially African-American kids, are frequently given different discipline consequences for the same infraction as white kids. Now that's really important to see, is that happening in Rochester? Because sometimes when people, I'm gonna be a little bit real here, uh, but it is in the interest of equity. Sometimes people think that any disparity is, uh, is the problem in and of itself. And of course it is, but if the behaviors are really happening and the disparity is reflecting the behavior, we don't want to actually uh, hide the data. We want to say what's causing those disparities and how do we get ahead of them? So a really important first question is, are we disciplining kids in an inequitable way? Um, and that's really critical, um, uh, which is to say, again, are white kids being given different consequences than kids of color? That's something we need to look at very carefully here in Rochester. To my, in my experience, that has not been examined. And there is evidence around the country that that is the case. And so that's one thing we need to do. A second thing that we need to do is we need to listen to the kids. We need to get the perspective of the students who are being directly impacted by these disparities. And so this week, we actually are launching something we're calling the Perspectives Project. And uh, Will Ruffin II, our uh, new uh, Executive Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion is gonna be leading this effort. And it is gonna be structured, careful focus groups with support from a research partner based in the Twin Cities Wilder Research, but that Will and our equity specialists are gonna be directly conducting because they have these relationships to really understand the factors that these students say are causing these disparities because we need their voices are central to understanding it we're also going to do those same focus groups and carefully designed protocol with staff who also have a critical role to play in that so this is a first step of understanding um, our consequences being assigned to kids inequitably here in rochester once again, evidence from elsewhere suggests that's likely to be the case, but we really need to understand that. And, and two, what do the students and what do the staff think are the factors that are influencing it? And then beyond this phase of understanding, we need to get ahead of this curve. And so one of the other things we've decided to do is we are gonna kick off a working group that is gonna focus on what increasingly is called restorative justice practices in schools. And to some people, this can seem kind of touchy-feely, but it actually has a growing body of evidence behind it, that the way you build relationships with kids, the way you connect with them informally, and then the way you address disciplinary incidents when they happen, whether it's between two groups of two, two students or students and staff, through structured processes like what's called a restorative justice circle actually has tangible benefits for school culture and those discipline disparities. So we're also kicking off a structured effort to look really deeply at restorative practices and ask if that can be part of our solution um, here in Rochester. So that's, I have to be honest, I don't think that's a sufficient answer to uh, this really complex 
uh, issue, but it's where we're starting is to really understand the problem and begin studying effective solutions to it that have actually been shown around the country um, to help uh, change this, this annual uh, situation of looking at this data and lamenting it, but not seeing it change. And I think of the applicability in the education environment and the workforce environment. I think we've touched upon that a little bit as well. I, I'm, I'm intrigued with the restorative justice proposition. Could you, could you give me an example? Uh, you talked about closing the circle on restorative yeah. justice. What, what, that, what that looks like in the educational environment? There's actually a really good policy brief that I can share or any of you could Google. There's a wonderful organization called the Learning Policy Institute, and they have a brief on restorative practices. It's pretty short. It's quick. So if you really want to get it. Um, there's a continuum and the informal so side of restorative practices is how before you ever have a disciplinary issue, you are proactively getting to know each kid for who they are, their likes, their, their struggles, their challenges. This might sound obvious, but very few schools have a very intentional, proactive way to do that, especially with the kids who are likely to get involved in school discipline problems. So at the front end of the, of, of the continuum is, is frankly structured intentional relationship building so that when that incident happens, that staff member has that relationship. Once you have actually had a fight, let's just take that, and you have consequences, maybe it's a consequence that's a discussion, or maybe there's something more severe, you don't just throw the kid back in that class. That is unresolved, unaddressed, let's just say tension, maybe trauma, depending on what's happened. So in a restorative uh, circle, you actually have uh, adults who know how to lead it, who are bringing the kids in, you bring that kid back in. And it's a, it's a, it's a really a wellness practice of giving uh, acknowledgement to what has happened. Um, having usually everyone in the circle saying, I want you back here. We need you back. We can, this is a reset button. There's also consequences. If the, if the person in the circle did something that, that there needed to be consequences for, um, but it's really a formal acknowledgement of this happened. We've named it and we want you back in our class, in our grade, in our school, potentially. It's not easy to do, actually. Um, I know we happen to have the Minnesota Teacher of the Year here in Rochester, Natalia Benjamin, um, who is a very you know, gifted educator, obviously, and she was talking with me about some restorative justice training that she had through our state teachers union. And she said it actually was one of the most inspiring and exhausting things she ever did because they actually forced the adults to go through the practice they're gonna lead with kids. Um, and so it's a heavy lift, but uh, she's one of several people who've been saying to me that that approach could be a powerful addition to what we're doing here in Rochester. Um, it can't be phony because kids can smell phoniness a mile away. You know, you have to have it. You have to be really ready to to lead those approaches. I like the intention. I, I really like the intentionality and the structure of the approach. I, I think we I think we sometimes hope this is how some of our teams handle issues themselves, but I think the intentionality of setting up the structure is, is particularly important. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, a lot of what I think my job is, is doing is actually just taking things that our best teachers, paraprofessionals, principals, others have done instinctively and always and sharing it because they, they were doing things like this without a name uh, for it. But then we need names and processes because we can't continue to see these disparities um, in, 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 in our processes and especially in our outcomes for kids. Well, and thank you for your leadership in doing that. You, you can be sure that we will be uh, excited to see all of that work develop and closely following it. Um, I, so I, I want to, we're, we're getting down to our last 15 minutes, and I definitely want to make sure that we follow up on um, the suggestion, Scott, that you had that uh, Mayo's enlightened self-interest might be aligned with further partnerships with Rochester Public Schools, and I want to make sure we, we revisit that. But before we get there, I just wanted to um, come back to you, Kent, for um, a, a little bit about the, the learning gaps or the education gaps that, that you hinted at as you were talking about the discipline disparities. And so it, it probably goes without saying that, you know, the, the past couple of years have just been an extraordinarily difficult time for everyone involved, well, really everywhere all the time, but, but specifically in the education context, students, families, teachers, nobody's been spared. Um, but the learning gaps that are becoming evident um, now um, are, are extremely concerning, really, for everybody. That time away from school and the disruption and the um, social and emotional wellness, it, it had uh, kind of grave impacts everywhere. 
what do we know about how those gaps are showing up for black and underrepresented communities and what is being done locally on that front? Some analysis that I did with a, a colleague who used to be the research director in Minneapolis, who we, we don't yet have a research office in Rochester Public Schools, but we're going to create one, um, suggested that Rochester kids made about, during the pandemic, about half the growth that they usually would have made in reading and math. That's growth, not proficiency, so progress. Um, and that was actually true at about the same rates for kids of color as white kids, but that's that's not a good news story. It's I mean, no, no kids did well in the pandemic uh, in terms of that particular measure. Um, looking beyond the pandemic though, I think one thing, and, I, and I'm a, there's a little bit of attention here because I, I, I thought Barbara's point earlier about, we have so many kids, kids of color, African-American kids in Rochester who are doing well, they're thriving, they're superstars. And, and yet this conversation is really rooted in those kids who are not on that trajectory, but it's so important to acknowledge that uh, what we're talking about is, is not the case for every kid. When you start to talk about um, gaps, the gaps that I'm most concerned about are not so much the gaps between student groups, though that of course matters. It's the gaps between what kids know and are able to do and what they want for their lives or what it takes to live, uh, it, it have a living wage job and live your dreams. And in Rochester, when it comes to kids of color, I think what we really need to think about very hard is we have a subset of kids in our schools who are progressing through them without mastery of some absolutely fundamental foundational skills. And when you only look at a proficiency rate, that masks that reality. And so if you just look at, well, everybody likes to talk about third grade, and I'm actually looking at it. Um, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you look at the scores on our state test, there's a lot of times I hear people say, well, a test score doesn't measure anything. Well, actually, the tests, whether it's our state tests or any other valid test, they're actually very reliable at both ends of the distribution. Kids who do really, really well are very likely to do very, very well. But kids who are really, really struggling are not going to suddenly be able to uh, um, uh, write well or perform these jobs. And so in 2019 in Rochester, for African-American kids in third grade, in mathematics, we had 38.9% who were in level one of the state tests. And that means possession of few fundamental skills. And in 2021, it was 51.7%. And in reading, it was 47.9% in 2019, and it was 57.5% in 2021. Um, those are not, there's a lot of kids above that level in the distribution, but those are kids who are in third grade and they absolutely are not uh, ready for the kind of higher level content that we need to uh, introduce them to and that they want in their lives. And so we've got to name that reality. It's a subset of kids and they, they're in our schools and they have all the potential we've been talking about the whole time. Um, and so it's a reality I actually haven't talked about publicly until this gathering, because I feel like I can do it here where we're not going to take a deficit approach. We're not going to blame those kids. We're not going to blame the families. We're also not going to blame the teachers. But we're going to say that we have a group of those kids and we really need to find ways to scaffold up their learning because we know that what's the, the progression for those third graders beyond third grade is going to be very difficult if they lack some of those fundamental competencies uh, in, in literacy and numeracy. So sorry for the, the long, uh, maybe not entirely linear answer. Um, but it's something I've been been very focused on. Thank you, Ken. For that. I, I, I think about that in terms of some of the you know uh, programs. Uh, Justin, you asked about kind of Mayo's engagement in the in the, the public schools. Uh, I you know we have programs like Inside Out where we uh, really look at uh, partnering uh, Mayo leaders with uh, science leaders and students uh, in pre K through uh, twelve. To help reimagine science programs and and to help address uh, gaps in exposure uh, of, of you know what could largely be considered STEM opportunities, uh, but but really looking at partnering with the schools to provide that exposure and they actually do it through zebrafish, which is which is fascinating, a way to help teach uh, students about science, but that in and of itself, back to Kent's point, can only go so far. Uh, because the this, this students, if, they, if they're reading or writing behind where they could or should be, uh, then they can have the desire, but maybe they won't have the capability unless they have a different type of an intervention 
or support to help them overcome those challenges. And I think that is, uh, that's what I think what makes the, the challenges. So uh, obviously multifactorial, but, but also, but so uh, difficult to try to approach in a comprehensive way. Thank you for that, Scott. And actually that's a good segue into the final question that I have. And I wanna open this question up to everyone. So while Mayo Clinic is uh, certainly not the only employer in Rochester, it is overwhelmingly the largest employee in the community. Actually more than 10 times the next largest employer, which is the Rochester Public Schools. Of course, the Rochester Public School has an impact on our community that goes far beyond its role as an employer by educating the bulk of the students in this community. Given that outsized influence of Mayo Clinic and Rochester Public Schools on the future of this community, is there anything more or different you would like to see these two collaborating on? Maybe, maybe I'll just briefly start. I've talked a, a ton and it's such an honor to be here. I would love, we have done amazing, what I might call, um, single point projects, which is to say they're powerful. We have an amazing clinic at our area learning center. We have an amazing partnership with our P-TECH program. We have an amazing partnership with the zebrafish um, that you just mentioned. And all of those are fantastic. I think to partner also on the core uh, education that we're giving to all kids, especially our kids who are struggling um, is, and it's not at the expense of those, those very innovative focused partnerships, but really the quality of education we're providing to all kids in Rochester Public Schools, it would also be a very exciting focus. And I'll just say some leading thinkers in my world, I think are finally waking up to the fact that it's not just academic outcomes, especially that you can measure on a standardized test, it's wellness and well being. And so to partner in an emphasis on well-being for the kids that we're talking about, including all the expertise that Mayo Clinic has, um, could be really, really exciting. That's very nebulous, but um, you asked. I, I, I think it's I think it's actually well stated, Kent, because because you, what you're trying to do is give some voice to the complexity of both the challenge as well as the multitude of opportunities that the two organizations could choose to focus on uh, together in, in, in ways that are mutually beneficial. Uh, you know, the, the RISE program is a great example of one of those ways, right? I mean, that's one of the ways to try to target um, a, 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 an opportunity for the, the organizations to work together. But I do think the continued conversations around even more fundamental ways for the organizations to work together, I think, I think would be helpful. Uh, we, we all, I think, um, and certainly myself having been in the community and having a child go through the, the public school system, we see kind of some of the disparities and the disadvantages and the what, what contributes to those and what the outcomes of some of those are in, in the city. And so I, I do think that from an organizational perspective, continue to look for creative ways to build on whether it's rise or zebrafish or, or other things into a more, uh, I'll just say a broader uh, and more, we'll get back to the word systemic, uh, systemic collaboration uh, between the organizations. I think that could be, could be a great, uh, there will be great opportunities there. Love it. Can't wait to see what happens on that front. Um, so uh, to, to Jerry and, and Barbara, and I guess anybody else, we're, we're getting down toward the end here, but what can we do to encourage community members, whether they're Mayo Clinic employees or otherwise, to serve as mentors for the Rise for Youth program? We definitely want the kids to apply, but we need mentors as well. How can we encourage those mentors? I guess I'll start so that the last thing you hear is from the smarter and wiser person. Um, <laughs> I'll, um, I'll say that when it comes to uh, leaders of color, um, I've never found an unwillingness on their part to lean in in this way. Um, 
the challenge tends to be ca uh, capacity because it's those very same people who end up getting kind of pulled and stretched in multiple ways within their employer organizations, their community affiliation and uh, professional affiliations and their churches and their families. It's, it, it, it really ends up being how many different places and spaces can I put my body into and or the few other people that look like me with positions of privilege and influence. So that said, <laughs> um, I'm going to just, I'm going to um, pull on something that my friend um, Barbara said earlier, and I wrote it down, um, you know, which was, you don't have to have cancer to treat cancer, and you don't have to be Black to represent their interests, is what I'll say. And so I'm going to pull on um, people who maybe aren't of color to also lean into the spaces of mentorship. Um, and I and I like to make just kind of this plea and ask for, you know, white people of our community to be allies, sponsors, mentors, and really be participants in ways that maybe doesn't look the same, right? Or even sometimes feel the same, but has darn good intent and 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 um, and influence and suggestion and heart. And so, um, so hopefully that that'll just uh, uh, kind of touch on my thoughts related related to that. And thank you, um, Jerry. And I would just to wrap that up and put a bow on it, because I think you said it very well. Just remind us, Jerry, Jerry mentioned earlier, she and I had the privilege of being at a conference on DE&I last week. And one of our colleagues, Matt Horace, who uh, is a member of the NAACP and a friend of DE and I at Mayo. He's our chief security officer. He left us with this: these words, "If not now, when? And if not me, who?" So I would just say, you know, think about what Jerry said and know that don't wait for your neighbors to do this or your coworkers to do this. If not you. Who it should be you who reaches out and says, I'm willing to lean in and mentor kids in this program. So we would love to have have you. And for those that are interested, check out the Rochester Branch NAACP site to learn all about the Rise for Youth program. We want to hear from you. Um, for the youth that are that are watching, or for those of you that are that know some, some high school students or youth under age 21 that might be eligible for either of the Rise for Youth programs, um, please encourage them, uh, remind them, uh, get those applications in. They're available now. Um, it's just going to be an awesome opportunity this summer. We can't wait. Um, uh, I'm going to invite the, the president of our Rochester branch, uh, Wale Legbede, to come in and close us out. But be but just want to reiterate my gratitude to all the panelists. Thank you for your perspectives, for your passion, for, um, for bringing it tonight. And uh, so grateful for the, the pleasure of your company tonight. And thanks to Wanda. This was fun. Yeah, uh, uh, Justin, Tawanda, and uh, just a, our whole panelist. Uh, this was such an informative uh, conversation. Thank you for... Uh, your authenticity. Thank you for just being free to share information. And uh, uh, really, and also just uh, uh, highlighting a, a lot of uh, some of the, the structural issues and, and why Rise for Youth is needed. Uh, this is an intentional focus. I appreciate uh, 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 the superintendent talking about, you know, some of the uh, uh, just the achievement gaps uh, uh, disparities that we have and, and how we close that. Uh, uh, Mr. Scott Beck, I appreciate uh, the, just the sharing of the equal uh, uh, internship approach and how that's intentional. Uh, uh, Ms. Jerry Irby, appreciate your, your perspective from an HR uh, uh, perspective and how we really move forward. And, and obviously, Barbara, uh, you're our matriarch of the end of ACP. Uh, we appreciate your your wisdom your and your guidance and, and mentorship. So, uh, so this is an important program, you know, uh, please apply. And in terms of the mentors, we are looking for anybody. If you're willing to serve, if you're willing to provide your knowledge, your access, uh, everything you have, if you're willing to, to offer it, we're gonna take it. And, and because our kids need this and, and it's not a question of talent. 
You know, the, the talent is there. And if we believe talent is equal, and I, we certainly do believe that, uh, how do we get over this hump? So really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, before we close, we'll just share uh, a little bit about our, our next event. Um, and, and actually, before I do that, again, it's also important to just to acknowledge that this is, uh, yes, it's a, a Mayo Clinic and, and NAACP uh, strategic collaboration, but we're not the only ones that are doing this, right? There are other similar programs. But also within the RISE program, we have our community partners that are going to be helping us select students, you know, our friends at Diversity Council, uh, Barbershop Talk, you know, educators, our Somali community. So, so this is really uh, a community, a, a led initiative and the NAACP, we believe that every child just deserves that opportunity to reach your full potential. And that's why RISE is so important. Uh, with that being said, uh, in terms of our next event, uh, it's going to be this Saturday, and I'll be joining a barbershop talk with uh, Pastor uh, Andre Crocker and, and, and um, uh, Mr. Uh, Board Bud Whitehorn. And essentially, we're going to be talking about how we rise together in the community. And so please uh, also feel free to, uh, to check us out there. And, and then essentially, that will wrap up the whole Empower Month, right? So this Empower Month, you've heard about Rise for Youth how to get engaged, you know, that's the easy part. The, the, the next part is put in your applications, mentors, you know, there's gonna be a process where you'll uh, get engaged. Uh, please, as, that, as we communicate that, get engaged. And then come June 1st, you know, that's gonna be our, our first summer program for, for RISE for Youth. And then we're also gonna have one in July. Uh, uh, so uh, our students are gonna be providing transportation, we're going to be providing equipment, access, a stipend uh, uh, for students, and more importantly, quality content and, and, and the mentors. So all of this is important. So just uh, please share it with your friends, share it with your neighbors, uh, students. Uh, Mr. Uh, Peckle, please share this within the uh, within Rochester Public Schools because we want everybody because we want every brain in the game. So as uh, Barbara uh, just uh, said, so. Appreciate you all. Uh, thank you for, for everything and God bless.